Great. So um, the next talk and the last talk for uh, today will be by Anne Spearing uh, from Trinity College Dublin. And Anne will be telling us about integrability and chaos in super yang moles theories from the anomalous dimension spectrum. Please go ahead, Anne. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to begin with thanking the organizers for all the work into putting together this nice event and inviting me to speak here. Um, so I'll be talking about a project that I've been doing um, together with Tristan McLaughlin and Raul Pereira, and it is based on um, this paper here and also some um, more ongoing work, more recent work. And it's about anomalous dimension spectra and super young modes theories. And so these anomalous dimensions will play the main character in my talk. And I'll discuss how statistical properties of large sets of anomalous dimensions can help us understand the underlying theory. In particular, we will find integrability and chaos from this spectrum. And um, just as a quick overview, I will begin with just reviewing a bit the spectral problem of n equals four, the dotation operator, some bits that uh, Matthias already mentioned, but really just to get started and set up the notation. And I'll also, a bit independently from this, start discussing spectral statistics and the relation to integrability and chaos, discuss how to see integrability and chaos in the spectrum. Um, which I think was also briefly mentioned in the panel discussion, so I'll try to add more to this. And then um, I'll try to bring those two things together using the spectral statistics for n equals four spectra and its deformations. And I'll begin with level statistics in, in the planar limits of super young modes theory and show uh, super young modes theories and show how integrability and chaos can be seen in those spin chain systems. And um, here I'll also talk a bit about data preparation and introduce one of the observables that we use to analyze the spectrum. Then I'll move on to anomalous dimension spectra of non-planar theories um, for pure n equals four and the beta deform theory. And we'll show you the results of these spectral analyses. And we'll also introduce another, another observable that we use. And then I'll just finish with a conclusion and outlook. And please, if there's like yeah, anything um, unclear, just um, go ahead and interrupt me. Okay, so let me ugh, this doesn't work. Let me start with what kind of the motivation was for us to start looking at spectral statistics, and um, that's the mixing in n equals four super and modes theory in particular, and the plane unlimited at finite n. And just to bring kind of everyone on the same page, I thought I'd start with just a quick review. And to make things very simple, I'll get started by focusing on maybe the simplest um, and best known sector of n equals four, which is the scalar SU2 sector. So, um, well, yeah, n equals four contains gluons, fermions, and scalars. There are six real scalars, and the SU2 sector is the sector of two complex linear combinations of these. Um, and I'll denote them by X and Z. And so in this sector, we would be interested in local and in local gauge invariant operators um, where I take those x's and z's and put them into traces. And so, for example, I can build a trace, a single trace of just one of those x, well, one of those fields <clears throat> like this. I can also have insertions of, of the other field and have operators like this. And then I can also form double trace operators just by taking products of those traces and general multi trace operators. Um, and maybe let me also mention here that we looked at n equals four with gauge group SUN, so um, n will be the rank of the gauge group. And now each of the operators that I can build has an associated scaling dimension that characterizes the operators and is an important input into correlation functions. Um, with n equals four and all the deformations that I'll be looking at being exactly conformal, there's like no energy spectrum. But there is this hidden spectrum of scaling dimensions and an efficient way to obtain um, obtain scaling dimensions for a large number of operators is via the dilatation operator. In the form of this dilatation operator in n equals four super n modes theory is known to one loop order um, and also to higher orders in certain subsectors. And in the SU2 sector, it has um, this well known form. This first term here is just the tree level 
term and it contains the two fields x and z that span the SO2 sector. It also contains um, the functional derivatives x check and z check. Um, and they I give the explicit relations here, but basically this x check is um, like an annihilation operator on the field X. And so if I, for example, take this combination and act on a general local operator, this will pick out all the X's and kind of annihilate them. And then in this combination, they're just directly replaced with this X. So this counts the number of X's in an operator. This similarly counts the number of Z's in an operator. And so this gives me the length of an operator in the SO2 sector, which for a purely scalar operator is just the classical scaling dimension. Then at one loop order, um, this is the, the contribution to the dilatation operator. And um, now this contains um, yeah, like products of a functional derivatives. And when acting on, on yeah, general um, local operators in the sector, this can really change the, the structure of the operators. So if I take this this one loop dilatation operator and act, um, for example, on this general single trace operator. This will give me back single traces, but maybe they have different orderings of the x's and z's, but I can also get back double trace operators. And as an example here, I look at the action of um, D2 on a double trace operator, and here you can see that it only mixes into single traces. And if you wanted to solve this mixing, then you would probably first think about what operators could possibly mix into each other. And then realizing that this dilatation operator does not change the number of X's and Z's, you would quite quickly come up with this list. And then computing the mixing by acting with the dilatation operator, you would find such a mixing matrix. This third line here uh, corresponds to this equation. And then you can take this matrix and diagonalize it. And I think in this sector there are um, three protected operators and one operator console when you and on this dimension. Um, and so for very short operators, you can do this diagonalization quite quickly by hand, but the dimension of those mixing matrices gets very large very quickly when allowing for longer operators and yeah, it's also interesting to understand this problem a bit more generally. And in the planar limit, this is achieved with the oil of dilatation operator maps to the integrable Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And so we can use integrability techniques to solve the mixing problem analytically with um, the single trace operator becoming a cyclic spin chain. And um, this is not only true for the SO2 sector, but all of them goes far and extends beyond um, one loop order. At finite end, we don't really know how to diagonalize this in the general case. Um, certainly there's very impressive results for specific operators, but we don't know how to handle this in the general case. What we can um, always do as long as the operators are not too long is um, kind of just to take the dilatation operator, maybe to be a bit more efficient, um, put the dilatation operator and its action into, for example, Mathematica, and then solve the mixing um, just by direct diagonalization numerically. And this is what we did. And then, like, if you do this and look at the anomalous dimensions of a large number of operators, you just find a large list of numbers, uh, the anomalous dimensions of the operators. And then the question is, can we actually learn something from these numbers? Can they help us understand the underlying model? Um, and yeah, we asked this question for the non-planar spectrum, but also more recently looked a bit more at um, different planar theories. And um, yeah, so this question of what can we learn from a given spectrum about the underlying model is actually a very old one. And so I'll um, just review some bits that we used from this work. And for this, I have um, three spectra here. The first one is just the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator. All the energy levels are evenly distributed. And then at the other end here, I have kind of the opposite spectrum here. I pick the levels randomly from a certain energy interval. In all of these examples, the mean level spacing is the same. But if I pick levels randomly, they can be quite far like here, or they can also be arbitrarily close, like here and here, the levels are almost on top of each other. And this spectrum I'll call uncorrelated or Poisson spectrum, and an example for this is the spectrum of the Heisenberg spin chain. 
And um, then I have a third spectrum here in the middle, and it was really kind of in the middle, as in the levels are maybe not as regular as in the first case, but they also don't want to get like too far or too close. And um, the spectrum is related to random matrix theory. And in this example, I, I diagonalize just a real symmetric random matrix. And the, those real symmetric random matrices, the corresponding ensemble is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, or, or GOE in short. And this is a very important ensemble for physics. Um, Vigna already in the 50s realized that um, those GOE spectra resemble the spectra of large nuclei. This realization then initiated the whole development of random matrix theory, and people realized that a lot of spectra can be described by random matrix theory, in particular this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And actually, um, over the years, people realized that it is um, quantum models that have this spectrum that have chaotic classical limits. Um, and so they would have been considered quantum chaotic. And so despite chaos being chaotic, there still is some structure in these models in that the distribution of energy levels resembles the distribution of eigenvalues of random matrices. And these observations then led to the conjecture by Buigas, Janoni, and Schmidt that quantum chaotic models have spectra that look like um, random matrix theory spectra. And then over the years, a lack of a good definition of quantum chaos, this connection between chaos and random matrix theory was kind of turned around and um, like finding random matrix theory in a spectrum is kind of used as a definition of quantum chaos. And so this is also what I'll use in, in this talk and I'll elaborate more on this um, later on, like um, what sort of observables that we looked at. And similarly, people also realized that quantum systems that are integrable, like the Heisenberg spin chain, but many more systems, they have a spectrum that is Poisson distributed, and this is the content of the Berry Tabor conjecture. Um, there are some attempts for proofs of these statements, in particular for semi-classical theories, but they are rather limited. And so this is more of a conjectural statement, or if you wish, you can use them as definitions of chaos and integrability. Um, there exist other formulations of, of um, well, both chaos and integrability, of course. Um, this here is maybe um, one of the oldest and traditional ones, but I believe we will hear more. Um, we will hear about another formulation tomorrow to make you talk. But yes, um, so in all of these cases, we have different, like all of these spectra, we have different correlations between energy levels, and these correlations can tell us about the underlying model. And so in our work, we took, if you want, these um, definitions of chaos and integrability and applied them to the spectra of certain conformal superhangmals theories with a hope to get a better understanding of universal properties of observables of these theories. Okay, so um, hopefully having motivated why it could be interesting to look at numerical spectra, I will in the following move on to first discussing level statistics for planar theories and show how integrability and chaos can be seen in spin chain systems that are interesting in the context um, of n equals four and its deformations. Um, but before jumping right in, we have to do a bit of data preparation that I'll quickly comment on since in some way it was um, the reason for us was broadening the application of these techniques to more general um, theories than, than pure in equals for. Okay, yeah, so imagine we have um, implemented the one root dilatation operator, for example, into Mathematica and it's a two sector. And then maybe we are interested in the spectrum of say length twelve operators in the planar limit. Then you would write down all your length 12 operators, you act with a dilatation operator to find the mixing matrix, and then you diagonalize it, and then you look at the eigenvalues. And then one of the first things you probably realize is that there are degeneracies in the spectrum. And degeneracies usually don't appear unless there is a reason. And one reason are symmetries. And there are some very obvious symmetries. For example, the dilatation operators invariant under an, like, kind of a spin flip and an exchange of x's and z's. 
Um, and so if I have an eigenstate of the dilatation operator and just exchange the x's and z's, then this will also be an eigenstate with the same eigenvalue. And so I find those kind of degeneracies and the symmetry is part of a bigger SU2 symmetry, the residual SU2R symmetry, which arranges all, um, all states in primary and descendants, descendant fields. And the descendants, they have the, the same numbers dimensions as the corresponding primary field. And um, so there's this symmetry, there's also parity, which acts on states um, by reversing their ordering. So, for example, if I act on trace of x, z, x, x, z, z, then this becomes trace of x, z, z, x, x, z. Um, and so parity is also a symmetry of the dilatation operator. And so then you find those parity pairs in the spectrum. And then there's also um, in the planar limit, also the number of traces is a conserved quantity. And I don't really want to go into all of these details. The main thing is um, that the symmetries can lead to degeneracies in the spectrum. And we kind of know them. And if we leave them in the spectrum, they will overlay the correlations that we want to look at. And so we go to sectors of fixed quantum numbers to avoid these degeneracies and look at operators whose mixing is not ruled out by some, some symmetry. And so, for example, we would look at um, the highest weight states of a spin chain of a given length and would form definite parity states and, for example, only look at positive parity states and focus on single traces in the planar limit. And I, I know that Matthias actually does not like me putting parity here. This parity is actually a very crucial symmetry for integrability, having those, um, those parity pairs. But in this approach, actually, we see the integrability just by focusing, for example, on the positive parity states alone, so, or similarly on the negative parity states. So there, there might be something interesting to, to understand here about integrability. But I'm jumping ahead. So um, we do this desymmetrization of the spectra to look kind of beyond the symmetries that we know. And so we do this, but the thing there is then that in the end, we will do a statistical analysis of the spectrum and this desymmetrization can quite drastically reduce the number of states, in particular in the planar limit, when we only focus on single trace states, um, this makes the statistics really a lot poorer. And for this reason, um, but also because it's an interesting generalization, we did not only look at planar and equals for supernovas theory, but also marginally deformed versions, which have less symmetry and are thus a bit more useful for this kind of um, analysis of statistical properties of spectra. And so now pure n equals four is actually contained in a much larger class of supersymmetric conformal field theories, which can be reached by marginal deformations. Um, Strassler classified these and found that this marginal deformation of, N equals, of the n equals four superpotential breaks the supersymmetry to n equals one supersymmetry, but the theory remains exactly conformal given one um, constraint equation on the new parameters lambda, q, and h. And then Bunzig and Manson went ahead and computed in the chiral scale a sector the planar Hamiltonian at one loop order, which is a nearest neighbor spin chain Hamiltonian for a, for a spin one system. Um, so this, the, similar to, I think, Matthias' notation, the superscripts denote the, the, the side of the spin chain the operator acts on, the subscripts um, here in the, in the definition of those um, Hamiltonians, they um, denote the flavor action. So for example, this first term here contains an E1 comma one, which maps a phi one to phi one. A second term contains, for example, an E2 comma one, which maps a phi one to a phi two and so on. Now, all those different terms um, with different prefactors depending on Q and H um, and well, the explicit form of this is maybe not as so important for the talk, but you can take it and implement it into, for example, mathematics and compute planar anomalous dimension spectrum. And um, in this paper, the authors also found integrable points 
And maybe if, if I set Q to one and H to zero, then this is just the undeformed spin chain. If I leave H um, being zero, but Q becoming a phase, then this is also integrable and corresponds to the, to the real beta deformation. But there are other interesting integrable points. Um, for example, there's this here where I turn off this um, Q and only have this H deformation. Um, okay, so now um, I can go ahead and implement this operator and solve the associated planar mixing um, problem numerically. And as a small example here, um, here's the result for length six operators in the SU2 sector with three excitations um, in the beta deform theory. So I plot the, the energies as a function of the deformation parameter beta. And um, beta, beta being zero here, just corresponds to the undeformed theory. And you can see that there are degeneracies. And there are also quite a few protected operators. But then as I turn on the deformation parameter, the deformation, uh, the, sorry, the degeneracies are lifted, and a lot of protected operators become unprotected. There is still um, maybe a couple um, protected operators, but I, I don't plot them here. Um, so you can see that degeneracies are generally lifted in the deformed theory, although there are still some level crossings, and they typically appear at values of um, at rational values of beta over pi, where the deformed theory is an orbifold of the undeformed theory. But for generic values of um, beta, you would find bigger sectors due to a reduced symmetry. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is unfolding. Um, when Wigner realized that the spectrum of heavy nuclei looks like the spectrum of random matrix theory, then this wasn't actually a statement on the level of the overall form of the spectrum. Here I plot um, the spectral density row of a 2000 by 2000 real symmetric random matrix as a function of the energy. And what you get is um, Wigner's um, famous semicircle law. So the probability for, for finding states um, with um, that are whose energy is really, really small or, or whose eigenvalue is um, really, really large is pretty low and really the most of the states are in the bulk of the spectrum. And the semicircle shape isn't very typical for a physical system, um, not for the heavy nuclei that Wigner looked at, um, but also not um, for the spectra that we'll analyze in, in the super young girls theories. Here, for example, is um, a spectrum of the planar beta deform theory um, this is um, at finite, and, and you can see that the spectra don't really look like, like semicircles. And so this average trend of the spectral density, this is really a theory-dependent quantity. And so, for example, for different nuclei would look differently. The statement that Wigner made with this large nuclei and that I want to make in this talk in relation to supersymmetric gauge theories is not about this overall trend, but is really about fluctuations around this overall trend. So those little things. And similarly here, you can have fluctuations around um, around the average shape. And in order to look at these fluctuations, we need to, to remove the average trend. And the procedure with which this is achieved is called unfolding, which I won't explain in detail. But basically, it's just you could just go into the spectrum, you go to parts of the spectrum that have a very high density of states, and there you stretch the spectrum, stretch, stretch it out a bit. Um, and then you go and compress the bits where you only have a um, few energy levels. And so that on average, everywhere in the spectrum, um, the energy density is one. And so if I kind of take all of these um, three spectra and unfold them, they would all have like a constant um, spectral density. And really it's the fluctuations around this, this mean density that is interesting and that shows universal behaviors that one can compare between different theories and that um, will tell us about integrability and chaos. Um, okay, so now, 
suppose we have computed the eigenvalues of a given spin chain Hamiltonian, we were careful about desymmetrization and unfolded the spectrum, then what, what can we compute to get an understanding of the correlations in the spectrum? Now, one thing um, that you can compute is the nearest neighbor spacing distribution. Um, so assume these are some of the um, unfolded levels that I got. And then for the nearest neighbor spacing distribution, we you know, compute the spacings um, of the adjacent levels. So I would compute all those spacings, denote them by little s, and then take all, I would take all those spacings and bin them and compute the ratio of the spacings laying in each um, bin to get the distribution. And before coming to the results um, for, for the spectra that we analyzed, let me just quickly discuss what could be the result of such an analysis. In the case of the uniform spectrum, so for example, for the harmonic oscillator, the spacing distribution is trivial. All the levels are separated by the same amount. If I have unfolded the spectrum, the mean level spacing is one. And so I just get um, the direct delta around one. In the case of the uncorrelated or Poisson spectrum, I get the Poisson distribution, this blue curve. And for, for random matrix theory, depending on the ensemble, I get different distributions. And here is a plot of the Gaussian symplectic, unitary, and orthogonal ensemble. And um, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is the one that I already discussed before. This is the ensemble of all real symmetric random matrices. And for these, you get this um, kind of yellowish curve that was approximated by Wiegmann as roughly s to the uh, s times e to the minus s squared up to integers and factors of pi and then the green curve corresponds to the gaussian unitary ensemble so the ensemble um, of all random matrices invariant under unitary transformations um, so the complex emission ones and then there's also the gaussian symplectic ensemble so the ensemble of matrices that are invariant under symplectic transformations and conjecturally, this Poisson behavior corresponds to, um, like the Poisson behavior of uncorrelated spectra corresponds to an integral system. And um, all of these, these random matrix theory ensembles, they relate to different versions of quantum chaos. Um, okay, so now finally, what um, are our results for the Lee-Strassler spin chain? First, um, what happens at integral points? The expectation is that you find the Poisson behavior and the nearest neighbor spacings, and indeed, this is what we find. Here's an example where Q is zero, and I only turn on, on this H. And these data are from a certain desymmetrized subsector of length 11 spin chains with roughly 2,800 states. And the blue curve again is the Poisson distribution and the red data points follow it quite nicely. And um, we find similar results for the other, for other integrable points. And so this is consistent with integrability. And then um, what happens as we go away from these integrable points, the expectation is that the distribution shouldn't follow this Poisson behavior anymore. And indeed, um, looking at the same sector of the SU3 spin chain, but with a different Hamiltonian, um, these values of Q and H that do not just correspond to any of those integrable points, um, we find that the spacings are not uncorrelated anymore. So they are not Poisson anymore, um, but instead they are best described by random matrix theory. And, this points towards the chaos of the theory. And specifically, we find that the spectrum, the spectrum can be um, described by the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And so we can we just play a bit with the spectra. You can compute the distribution for various values of Q and H and find Poisson for the integrable cases in this Gaussian ensemble for the, for the non-integrable cases. And, I have um, a question. Yeah. Uh, so why uh, do you have a, a 
did you understand why the GUE, like it could be also GSD or GOE, but uh, maybe there is some symmetry or? Yeah, very good. Yeah, this is actually uh, something I want to discuss on the next slide. Oh, okay. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, but before answering this, I just um, wanted to discuss another spin chain system where we actually find a different ensemble. And um, this is, yeah, in the SU2 sector, um, the two loop dilatation operator of n equals four supernovas theory is actually also known. And so you might wonder what happens if we, when we add a small two loop piece um, to, to the one loop um, spectrum. And now the planar n equals four spectrum is integrable to all orders. But if I, I kind of take the perturbative expansion and chop off the higher orders um, and then use a finite coupling, I cannot expect integrability, but it's still interesting to look at. And um, so the Hamiltonian in this case, when written in terms of spin operators, becomes the next to nearest neighbor spin chain. This G is um, just lambda over 16 pi squared. Um, and well, this first term is not really, really relevant since with the um, with the spec level statistics, we are not really interested in the overall behavior of the spectrum, but more the fluctuations. So this just gives a kind of overall shift of the spectrum, and really um, those interaction terms are, are the ones that are relevant. And if I set G to zero, and we have um, this nearest neighbor interaction and. This, of course, corresponds just to the one-loop theory, and here I find um, integrability. I have a plot of this here. So again, the data points follow the Poisson curve. If I now turn on the second term um, here for G being 0.2, we find um, this spacing distribution, and this is now described again by random matrix theory, but now we find the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So again, we find, um, find chaos. Um, but yeah, maybe now again, so this is not saying that planar n equals 4 is not integrable to higher loop orders, but it's only integrable at finite g if you include the whole, whole perturbative series. If you chop off higher loop corrections, the spin chain is chaotic and we find this GOE chaos. And so now indeed, um, why is it that we find GOE in this case, but GUE in the Lichtwasser spin chain for, for your generic values of those deformation parameters? And basically the statement is that whenever there is um, some sort of reality condition on the Hamiltonian of the system, then the corresponding spectral statistics is GOE. And if not, then you find GUE. And in particular, if you have a time reversal and rotational invariance, then you can show that you can choose states in such a way that the Hamiltonian is real and symmetric. And so it would be a member of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And um, maybe a bit more formally, if you can construct a time reversal symmetry from a complex conjugation and an operator K that satisfies this constraint, then again, you can show that um, the Hamiltonian can be chosen real and symmetric in a, in a suitable basis. And indeed, may I have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so in the, in the right-hand side graph is basically uh, two loop, including two loop, uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference between the yeah. left and right. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's just that oh. I turn on this G here. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. So so this is a beta deformed case. Sorry, say that again. I mean, this model is a beta deformed. A Q, Q only Q is non-zero, and H equal zero. Oh, sorry, this is again kind of for, for undeformed n equals 4, so q is 1 and h is 0. Yeah, h equals 0 and the beta is non zero. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah, actually, no, sorry, yeah, I have, the, I have the Hamiltonian here for the undeformed theory, but actually in the plots I'm using again the beta deformation. So actually, this is not the Hamiltonian that you have to use, but you have to kind of go into the Hamiltonian and put in the, the, the e to the i betas, the deformation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this mm, yeah, method from the Supermi theory is all loop integrable. It is, yeah. And uh, then why it shows this uh, this uh, non-integrable behavior? Yeah, it is integrable in when you really introduce like when you really have all the the whole perturbative expansion. Like when you 
yeah, have this whole perturbative expansion. If you kind of truncate the expansion and um, don't include higher order corrections, then then what we find is chaos. But yeah, really, like planar n equals four is integrable to all loop orders. But if I kind of chop off the expansion, then we find chaos. Then, it, then it, if you include more, uh, if you uh, decrease the value of g toward the zero, then there is some kind of transition from this uh, this non-integral distribution to this uh, uncorrelated distribution. That's right. Yeah. For for yeah, as I go to g being zero, I'm I'm transitioning back to the Poisson case. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so are you at finite n here? Have you taken into account trace relations? Oh, no, no, sorry. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still discussing planar level statistics. So this is all spin chain, single traces. Yeah. So you're saying um, that even in the planar theory, when you start to add these uh, loop effects, you see um, the random matrix statistics. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if you kind of land on a spin chain on a yeah, planar model that is not integrable, then you then we find this random matrix theory behavior. Yeah. For for the models that we looked at, like this um yeah, the H classical spin chain. Um and if we take yeah the the n equals four spin chain and yeah add kind of I mean, it doesn't really make sense to kind of take the perturbative expansion and chop off the higher order terms and then use a finite value of the coupling. Um, but yeah, if you do this, then you also find chaos. That can be described by random matrix theory. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, so I was um, discussing this um, GOE and GUE case and saying that for GOE we need some sort of reality condition that can be achieved by like such a time reversal symmetry and indeed um, in the case of the two loop um, as to two Hamiltonian you can construct um, such a symmetry just from the um, charge like from the normal complex conjugation operator and um, parity operator and so we find kind of this gives you a reality condition. So we find GOE in the SU3 sector of this niche um, Trasler spin chain there. Um, we, there does not seem to be a similar operator. Um, this operator you can build in the SU2 sector does not generalize. And so the system shows GUE chaos. Um, okay, so now having discussed integrability and chaos and spin chain systems in, in the planar limit of super young Mills theories, I will now move on to finite and non-planar spectra and I will kind of um, jump in right away by discussing the results of a level spacing analysis for non-planar spectra and then also discuss um, another observable that we used. Um, so at the non-planar level, we looked at the undifferent um, theory, but also the beta deform theory, and for the latter, the dilatation operator, including non-planar contributions, is given by this expression here, which we obtained um, from a certain on-shell technique, and it contains a single trace term. Um, similar to the one in the undeformed theory, only now the, the commutators in here are deformed. And so this commutator XC beta is kind of just like the usual commutator, only that I have faces in front of the two terms. And so this term is kind of inherited from the from the undeformed theory, and only um, only the commutators are deformed. But then there is also a generally new term, um, a double trace deformation originating in a double trace term in the Lagrangian of this theory. It um, it is formally suppressed by one over n, but is crucial even in the planar limit for short operators. And when we study the finite n case, we also include it. Um, at, at the non-planar level, actually, the statistics, even in the undeformed theory, is, is not so bad because we don't have to restrict only to single traces. But introducing um, a deformation, again, allows for better statistics. And just as a quick illustration of this, I, again, have here the spectrum of length six operators. This 
um, this plot here is the one that I showed you before in the planar case. So this was the planar length six spectrum from before. And now I have um, the analogous spectrum at finite n. And um, already in the undeformed limit at beta being zero, you can see that degeneracies are lifted due to the finite end corrections when comparing with the planar results. But also here, there are more states because um, fewer operators are protected. And already an interesting feature of the spectrum that you can see when comparing with the planar case is that the levels seem to repel each other, like there are no like level crossings anymore. And even here, you can't really see this um, in, in, in this plot here, but if you have it open in Mathematica and zoom in, then you'll see that they actually do not cross. And um, so there's, there's level repulsion, and this is already a sign of quantum chaos. And um, to be more quantitative, we also do a um, yeah, level spacing analysis and find these plots. This is um, first for the beta deform theory at um, some value of beta, beta being 0.4. And this first plot is again in the planar limit where the spectrum follows this Poisson behavior. And this is contrasted um, with the spectrum at finite n. And here we find that the spacings are best described by random matrix theory. And in particular, this yellow curve corresponds to the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And so you see chaos in the spectrum. And so this was for the beta deform theory. We can also look at the undeformed theory. And um, so this first plot here is the result for the SU2 sector, where we again find GOE. And the second plot is for the SL2 sector, so the sector spanned by a scalar and a covariant derivative. And again, we find um, this, this random matrix theory behavior. And so what we find is that um, the planar spectrum of n equals four and its bit deformed version is well described by the Poisson distribution, whereas at finite and the results point towards quantum chaos of the spectrum is, is well described by random matrix theory, in particular this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And um, so we have seen integrability and chaos in the non-planar spectrum from the short range correlations. We actually in the paper also looked at long range correlations for spectral rigidity, and I don't really have time to discuss it, but there we find similar results. And then we also looked at another observable, and this is not based on the spectrum of eigenvalues of the mixing problem, but instead, if you can find the spectrum of eigenvectors, so corresponding to the eigenoperators of the dilatation operator. And here, what one can compute is the information entropy. And this information entropy is based on first choosing a reference basis for the eigenvectors, which I, I call um, cat A here. And so we would just take the eigenvectors and decompose them into in, in, in this um, reference basis, we just use the multi-trace basis, and then we extract the coefficients and plug them into the information entropy. For, so you get an information entropy for each of your eigenvectors. And what does this entropy actually measure? You can quite quickly compute it for a state that is evenly spread over the reference basis. And what you get then is that the information entropy is just the log of the size of the Hilbert space. If you have a state that is exponentially localized over your reference basis, over M of, of the states, then what you find is that the information entropy is log of Euler E times, um, times this size. And so in some sense, the information entropy measures how spread a given eigenstate is over your reference basis. And random matrix theory also makes predictions for this quantity in particular for, um, for a random matrix of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, the information entropy of the eigenstates is given by this expression here. And it is the log of um, some number, which if I remember correctly, something like 0.48 uh, times the size of the, of the, the, the dimension of the reference spaces. 
Um, and so we computed the information entropy for the eigenvectors of length six of the length a 16 mixing problem with seven excitations in the planar limit for the yellow points and at finite n for the blue points. And so this plot contains the information entropy of eigenvectors normalized um, by the by the GOE prediction, and on the x-axis is the associated energy eigenvalue. And you can see that at finite n, the entropy is very close to the GOE prediction, and um, on the um, um, and, and it's quite narrow. And narrow becoming really a function of the energy, whereas for the planar theory, the entropy is considerably lower and way more spread. And so also from the statistics of the eigenvectors, we see that the non-planar theories are well described by random matrix theory. And um, so this brings me to the end of the talk, and I'll just um, quickly finish with a short summary and outlook. So um, we I first discussed the leach Tassler spin chain models or like deformed spin chain models, and we found that um, planar spectra are compatible with the planar integrability of the corresponding integral models. And at non-integrable points, we find that the spectra are well described by random matrix theory. And depending on the on the model and their symmetries, they can be described by the corresponding um, ensemble. And we also looked at finite end spectra, where for the beta deformed theory and the undeformed theory, we find spectra, um, we find that the spectra are well described by random matrix theory, making them quantum chaotic. And so conjecture that in what's four and its beta deformed version are chaotic at finite end and can be described by this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And I think this um, this feature of non planar n equals four is actually quite remarkable. So despite this theory being, um, or these theories being so incredibly unphysical with all their symmetries, the conformal symmetry, the supersymmetry, the spectrum looks incredibly generic. Also, the spectra of physical theories look like this, like the spectra of heavy nuclei. And I haven't shown you the plots for this, but you can um, see a similar behavior also at small n, so when the rank of the gauge group is smaller than the length of the operator, where there are more trace identities you have to take into account. And more generally, I think this um, method of using statistics on numerical spectra is an interesting way to learn something about model, and especially when it is not accessible by analytic means. And now let me just finish with just a few words on open questions. And um, one thing I think you can try and do is go to other sectors, maybe look at other gauge groups and use this approach for other theories like ABJ. And then maybe when continuing further with this analysis of N equals four, maybe trying to see whether one can learn more from the spectrum. We looked at this nearest neighbor spacings, which is the short range observable with which you can only really say whether something is possible or one of those random matrix theory ensembles. Something a bit more fine grained where we can, for example, extract more uh, yeah, where we can extract more information would be interesting. In the paper, we also looked at the spectral rigidity, um, which is connected to, to two level correlations. Um, and from this, you can actually see that this behavior of Poisson or random matrix theory is only valid for a certain range in the spectrum. But for example, the chaos we find in spin chain systems looks kind of the same to the chaos at finite and um, could be interesting to see whether there are actually differences in the chaos, um, but for this you would need other observables. And then we also looked at, at the eigenvectors. Um, if you want to study thermalization, you would maybe want to compute the expectation values of time-dependent operators and then the multi-trace operator basis with a spin chain scalar product is probably not the best choice and a more natural choice would, would be the basis in which the two-point correlation function is diagonal. And there's um, quite some work on this in the UN theory. Um, for half DPS operates a short polynomials form a basis um, for the SO2 sector, you would look at restricted short polynomials. And then also this work was kind of inspired by the realization that large time fluctuations of ADS black holes and SYK models can be described by random matrix theory. And so it would, of course, be great to somehow connect with statistical properties of the tool gravity theory but um, you have to go to strong couplings, I guess, a very challenging problem. Um, 
So these are all the points that I wrote down on the slides, but really the overall question would be to better understand universal properties of superannual theory, in particular at the non-planar level. We seem to lose integrability, but there is still some structure. That is, for example, the distribution of scaling dimensions is described by random matrix theory, which is the property of chaos. And exploring this chaos further um, and really getting a better understanding of structures and the implications is, I think, a very interesting direction that can really um, provide deep insight into these theories. But I think with this, I will I'll finish and thank you. Thank you, Anne, for a wonderful talk. Um, are there any questions? Okay, I have a, a, two questions. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, your method is uh, more effective in, say, uh, perturbative integrability, especially one loop. So which is actually a nearest neighbor spin chain. So have you applied this uh, <clears throat> this uh, distribution uh, study for those um, uh, non-local spin chains, like long-range spin chains, which is integrable? No, we haven't. But um, yeah, that would be great um, trying it on other models. Maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I if think you have so. a spectrum, if you have a spectrum and you want to send it, I'll, I'll do the analysis. So you know, that's for example, like a color zero Sutherland model, which is a long range integral spin chain model, and you mm -hmm. can you can uh, solve numerically over the energy levels and with a you no, know, with a spacing distributions. Mm -hmm. And whether yeah, that they... sounds interesting, mm -hmm. but we haven't looked at it. Yeah. Also, another question is that this a least trust law model where Q equals zero and H is non-zero, which is a one loop integrable, but it's not all loop integrable. Um, that's probably too true. I'm not sure. And and then uh, have you have have you can. You, do you also study this model with a with a with a similar method? Because you showed only beta deformed data, not with this uh, Q equal zero and H non zero case. Uh, when uh, this oh, sorry, um, oh, this here is um, for Q being zero and H being non zero. Right, but this is uh, not including uh, this uh, two loop. This is just. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we only, we only looked at the one loop case. And that's, yeah, yeah, because, we, uh, we because only uh, really looked, mm -hmm. yeah, this model is actually different from beta deform case from two loops. So I want to see whether mm, there would be other terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for the two loop case, we kind of only looked at this here. So mm -hmm. you haven't analyzed mm -hmm. for, for no. this. Oh, yeah, that's okay. interesting. Thanks. Uh, may I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, so uh, here you talked about it, this, uh, the result is that the conformal dimension is uh, now, level spacing of the conformal dimension is uh, uh, follow the random matrix, for example, level spacing, right? So, mm -hmm. so is it equivalent to the statement that the N equal four super is a quantum K, uh, it's also chaotic. So is this same statement or? Sorry, I didn't get it. Oh, yeah, so just... here the conformal dimension is uh, follow the, the random matrix distribution. Mm -hmm. So it's it equivalent to the statement that uh, N equal four super is chaotic. So is this chaotic. same statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I mean, we expect that any equal push for young male at some temperature would be chaotic. But uh, this is a dilaton, distribution of the dilaton is uh, enough to uh, say that uh, some system, in this case, young male, is chaotic. Is it the same thing or some? Um, I'm not sure I have an answer, sorry. I don't know, uh, maybe Tristan is here and he knows what to say. I don't, sorry, I don't really. Uh, okay. 
I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it, yeah, I'm not sure. I have a related question, I think. So I'm somewhat confused. Uh, so well, you mentioned that in the planar, planar limit, and equal for square theory is integral, integral structure, Poisson distribution. So, mm -hmm. so as Jonggi mentioned, if I consider dual gravity theory, we have a black hole solution then we know that the spectrum has to be chaotic. So I'm somewhat confused to what, mm. what did, do I miss? Yeah, we are, the, those black hole solutions, they exist for, um, for when you have, we have infinite long, long spin chains and like they are um, of similar order to, to n or n squared. And this is kind of a region of the spectrum that we don't probe here. The length of our operators is, um, is smaller. So we first do the planar limit and then look, um, look at, um, at the operators. And for this, you would kind of have to define your operators that are this, uh, that are that go like n or n squared and then you send it um then you do the planar limit but so we can't reach this um this um we don't see this uh, this behavior here yeah any further questions Robert, there is just some chat. Oh. Oh. Okay, so um, there were some discussions in the chat, I guess from uh, Minkyu. So, uh, and from, oh, I see. So Monica has posted a question. She had, doesn't have a microphone. So let me read to you what she said. She said, what does your non-planar result on the spectrum imply about integral integrability of n is equal to four at even the first non-planar order? The, the first, yeah, I mean, we, we only really looked at finite n, so. I okay, so I, I think Tristan, Tristan has put a comment here, which I think is, is very relevant. So he's saying the computation in Anne's talk is at finite n in a large n expansion, it might be possible to use integrability. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. So calculating one over n effects, I guess, would be small corrections, but finite n means you've actually chucked out certain loops that are related to the others by base relations. So working at finite n is not the same as calculating one over n corrections. Mm -hmm. Maybe Tristan wants to comment? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't see him actually. Oh, no, I'm okay. Oh, I see. But we can't hear you here, yeah. Tristan. So. Okay. So I think if there's no further questions, let's thank Anne again for a great talk. Thank you. Okay. So um, uh, that's the end of um, the third day of the workshop.